I just want to introduce our illustrious guest today. Um, Gord Peteren really needs very little introduction, I think, but just for the purposes of process and context, um, I will share a few things about his career. Gord has been creating artworks, um, um, mainly in sculpture for the last 20 years of sculpture and painting. I'm sorry, Gord. He's a graduate of the Ontario College of Art and he has lectured and been published extensively across Canada and the United States and have participated in numerous exhibitions and conferences, including the Center for Art in Woods Wingate ITE residency in 2002. Um, he also, I think our paths first crossed in um, 2014 at Bellevue Arts Museum when Gord gave the keynote address to the um, biennial of that year. Uh, and the seminar that we held in conjunction with it. So it's been such a pleasure to be able to continue um, through my work with the Center for Art and Wood. Uh, as well as being a professor at the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto, Gord has also taught at Sheridan College in Oakville, the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, the Haystack Mountain School in Maine, the Penland School in North Carolina, and the California College of Arts. He has also done many artist residencies across the continent. He's been the recipient of Government Arts Council Awards and grants throughout his career. In 2001, he won the Jean A. Chalmers National Arts Award and was also inducted into the Royal Academy, Canadian Academy of Arts. In 2004, he received a Chalmers Arts Fellowship. His work is included in the permanent collections of many major museums, including the Chipstone Foundation, the Museum of Arts and Design, and of course, the Center for Art in Wood. So, um, Gord, if you're ready, I'm going to hand it over to you. And um, thank you so much for being here. Huh? Oh, wow. He can't hear us. Uh, I can hear you, Gary. Can you hear me? Very good. Um, well, uh, good evening, everybody. And um, thank you, Nava, for this opportunity. Um, I guess it's been uh, over 20 years that I have uh, enjoyed engaging with the membership and the activities uh, of the center, uh, mainly due to the encouragement of Albert Leekoff. Uh, and now you, Nava. So I thank you. Uh, for that, continuing that uh, abusive relationship. Uh. Gary's trying to tell me something. I have Gary Knox Bennett on my screen, so that's who I'm talking to here. Um, tonight, uh, I'd like to talk about something that is perhaps more elusive than art making. Um, and that's art landing. Uh, objects uh, don't ride alone. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, human psychological baggage connected and swirling about them. And the where and why and how objects end up with clients in clients' homes seems to be a mystery to a lot of artists. So I thought while I'm sharing my work with you this evening, uh, I might uh, share a little, uh, shed a little light on that uh, topic, uh, if possible. Um, I don't believe art is any one thing exactly. I look at it more like an approach uh, that seeps into everything I do, not just something that hangs uh, on the wall. I've sold uh, over 300 projects um, mainly to private homes, but also a lot of art in architecture um, and uh, public art projects as well. But the home um, is a very strange place. Uh, what are all those things that we have in our homes? that we covet so closely. Um, I believe that they are like the lens through which we see our world. 
and they're compiled from the various subconscious objects of desire that mill around in here. And I think when we go out in the world, we take our furnishings with us. They ride on our shoulder like a parrot, almost. Um, and I think that as artists, we not only have the responsibility to decode and launch our products into the physical, I think we also have an obligation to decode their landing. Um, how is our voice heard exactly? We've all seen how people perform in their homes with their stuff, but how often do we get the opportunity to go into people's homes and mill around their stuff when they're not there? So the other day I snuck into a client's home for you and uh, shot a little video as best I could. Um, and they were away somewhere. Uh, it was very strange for me. Um, but anyways, I, I just want to first of all, uh, show this video uh, to you of me breaking and entering. Uh, now, how am I going to do this? Click share screen. Where's the thing? Up top. No, I want to click, click in the video. Click in the video. There it is. There. All right. Thanks, folks. Hang on. Move your cursor out of the video. To hide it. I guess I should take my shoes off. <laughs> Ernie and Louise are away. Um, but unfortunately, I know where the keys kept hidden. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my practice, but I realized that my practice in a way begins when the objects land somewhere in someone's home. Um, so I thought I'd try and do a little tour of uh, one of my clients um, and sort of uh, talk about the various pieces. Uh, this piece was really the inception of um, their uh, collecting, I guess you would call it, of my work, uh, done in about 1990, which is really quite a significant uh, point in my life where I changed from being a, uh, well, a serious furniture maker to a uh, more of a sculptor. And um, Ernie requested that I make a sculpt, a base for one of his sculptures. It was a horrible sculpture. Sorry, Ernie. Um, and I proposed two ideas. One was a straightforward classic uh, sculpture base. And uh, the other was sort of this thing. Uh, fortunately, the sculpture is now up in the attic in the garage. Uh, this is a uh, bronze bowl. Uh, sitting on top that I made. I've done a lot of bronze casting. And uh, this might give you an idea of kind of the variety of things that I tackle. And um, I see the home as really quite an opportunity uh, for an artist. And um, well, this is uh, this uh, is a music sheet music cabinet, really, I guess. Uh, he has quite a significant collection of sheet music. And the, he had these old boards, which were, as you maybe can tell, spalted maple. And uh, through careful cutting up of the boards, I managed to align the spalt line all the way down through the front of the piece, which was very difficult to do. 
keep them lined up. Um, Ernie is quite musical, has a fabulous piano here. This is great. I get to see their home with all the junk all over the place. Uh, I forget what this was about, but that's something I made. Don't know what for. They have a fabulous art collection. A fabulous collection of everything, really. That's a great painting. Stephen Appleby Barr, I believe. Uh, Lockie Reed. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah. I go on a painting trip every, every summer with my daughter, Jasmine. And we ended up at Ernie's and, and Louise's house one day. And I found a styrofoam a cooler lid. Yeah, well. Ernie was over for dinner one night and Louise had bought him a new cashmere sweater. He took it off. And he never saw it again. <laughs> many, many parties at this dinner table. Fabulous evenings. You know, you, you begin to hear about and understand the performative qualities of the pieces that people have in their homes. Um, uh, well, uh, Ernie's uh, Aunt Ruth who used to do uh, paint by numbers and he handed me this. People bring me their stuff to my studio and, and think that I'm interested in junk, found objects, uh, which I am. And through the conversation, we discussed her and her, well, sliding mental state as she aged. And this was sort of the last paint by numbers she was working on and it never got any further than that. I just thought I should frame it and give it back to him. I think it's quite an important what's missing, what's accomplished and what's missing. Oh, Maurice. An Anne Savage painting. Sorry, I'm not a videographer. Uh, this is so strange. No one home. Um, I have a number of these uh, tables, uh, it seems, of mine. Well, I don't know where the compartments are on these things anymore. I forget. That's one. Vivian Meyer photograph, Alex, I think. No, that is a mean, sorry. I made these little things. Um, masks. My daughter came home from school one day and they made paper mache masks of themselves. I just took it to the foundry and had it cast in bronze. It's quite a horrifying thing now that I know it's her face. Bronze changes everything. For years, I made the uh, Furniture Society Awards of Distinction out of copper and mahogany. And these are all the leftover bits that I bolted together and made a bowl. And he saw it and purchased it. Uh, hung it over the fireplace. I don't know whether that works or not. Uh, in their living room here, um, I mean, everyone acquires stuff. So this is a quite a large cabinet. Uh, to try and 
house some of the intricate little things that people collect and want to display in an interesting manner. Um, the wires are visible throughout the piece. There's lights all throughout. I'm not a, I'm not going to uh, judge a person's collections of things. But it was an interesting uh, commission to try and facilitate So I think it would be very difficult to tell which pieces, which interventions are mine and which are theirs. And I like that. This is, you know, what did this thing look like when it was delivered? And that's a painting that we did. And I sort of hung it on a, uh, I don't know, swiveling armed frame inside. A painting I did of a cemetery. We used to live next to a cemetery and walk our kids when they were babies through the cemetery. I don't know, holy cow. I'm gonna get him to clean. Oh, I wanna to go to the next one. How do I do that? Just close this one or minimize it yellow, yellow. And now move the green on top of the next one. And hit Hang on folks. I accidentally shut the camera off. Move your cursor over the frame. Now we're continuing. To make a long story unbearable. I'm going to try and do a <clears throat> run through of everything if I can. Down into the lower level. This is an interesting piece I did called uh, Restored Night. Yeah, I came down here earlier to peek around. This is Ernie's workshop. Oh my God. She makes some pretty cool things when he's not working. Let's snoop around a bit. Jeez, this place is a mess. Junk everywhere. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some things yeah. he sent me some rose bush stems from his mother's 
garden after she passed away. And I made that uh, piece. And you see where it's ended up. Oh, beautifully displayed in the back room of the basement. I'm sure I can do it. <laughs> well, got to take the good with the bad. And how do objects perform? This is one, hopefully, one continuous recording that may, may or may not work. Back upstairs. inside the big white cabinet I showed you earlier. This clock ticks. It doesn't keep very good time and there is no face. But there's the key to wind it. And I had to cut off some of the chimes to fit into the case. So on the hour and a half hour it plays a relatively unknown tune. Hmm. I wonder, does an artist want every single thing to be theirs? Like a dog? Another one of those tables made of wood with probably access point of some sort. Why do people put their junk on my art? What's that all about, I wonder? I hope you don't mind me being here. John Scott, over the staircase. Another table made of wood. I think Louise has put a stop to purchasing these. I found often though my patients aren't cured with just one dose. I think that's a Maurice. Of course, on the way to the washroom, uh, one day Ernie was walking along beside a river and picked up this piece of driftwood and for some unknown reason mailed it to me. It came in a package, just like the rose stems did. So that was during the time when his mom was passing away, passing away. And uh, I just sort of put it on a cross, I don't know. These are important moments that need documenting, I guess. Mm. A study. I hope he doesn't get mad at me for snooping so much. Two little paintings, God, I did uh, when I was doing a residency in uh, in um, Colorado, Anderson Ranch. Am I jiggling too much? Are you getting dizzy? I can't think of anything else that I need to show you. <clears throat> and, uh, so I think I'll sign off and we can uh, have a conversation and you can ask me some questions, I suppose. 
I don't think that's real. Except for the controller. Minimize it. Click on the video. Putting the green out of the way, it's hiding the lines. Mm. Now I'll put the green on your on the part of that you want to share. <coughs> Can they hear me? I, think so. I was nervous doing that. Very nervous. <clears throat> Can I just do that? Sure. No. Oh, yeah. There we go. So um, my practice uh, covers a broad range of uh, things. Um, I've been fortunate enough throughout my career uh, that I've been able to basically make whatever I felt like. Uh, people have been quite tolerant. And um, as long as I <clears throat> explain it, uh, explain my ideas carefully to people, and sort of hold their hands, they start to get it. Um, and Ernie and Louise <clears throat> had been uh, acquiring things between about 1990, was maybe the first commission, until about 2010. Uh, so they're, they were early in my uh, development, so to speak. Uh, we're still close friends. Uh, well, I know where the key is to their house. Uh, I have noticed that the uh, urge to nest, uh, to, to collect things, to make a home, to get it right, uh, occurs, it seems, between the ages of uh, 40 and 65-ish, which is just something I've uh, come to recognize. There's a period of uh, nesting that happens with all of us, it seems. Um, I just want to go through this uh, uh, number of pieces that, that I ran the camera past. Um, and it's a funny thing because uh, they, uh, they never asked for this, but uh, I could see they had uh, a number of really interesting small things and the house was turning into a mess. So I thought that would be an interesting opportunity to kind of insert my mess with their mess and contain it behind some neat little doors. Uh, but when you open it up, the, 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 there's a real blurring that occurs between what's theirs and what's mine. And I find that uh, really interesting. People buy strange and interesting things if you give them permission. Um, I mean, they quite embraced uh, that uh, handle that pushes a bar in and out of a baby's throat. Uh, now that wouldn't be an easy sell unless it was kind of presented carefully, I don't imagine. I mean, he, Ernie did have a, a number of uh, glass pieces and God bless him, we have to forgive people for collecting glass, I understand that. Uh, this just, I mean, sometimes you open a door and there's half of nothing. It's just a cavity with some light. So And the piece, uh, the doors are simply the facade. Behind that is all walnut uh, shelving and, and, and gates and, and um, lights. So it's like a floating facade that uh, covers the whole thing. 
this is no great uh, artwork, perhaps. Uh, the only thing I found interesting about it was the, the line, the kind of musical black line that flowed all the way down through the front of the piece. I mean, uh, this may not seem very interesting, but from the boards that I had, achieving this was almost impossible. That's all this piece is, one line. I think this was, uh, Ernie purchased this for, like I think an, an, an anniversary gift for Louise. I'm not sure how she uh, reacted. <laughs> oh. uh, people give me things often, as I mentioned, um, and I often uh, redirect or repair their identity. Um, for instance, this stick. Uh, from a very loaded time in, her, in his life. Aunt Ruth's incomplete paint by numbers. And look at the title. Port of Yesterday. I saw no way to improve this work. Um, I felt it was already finished in its incompleteness. Um, often all found objects require is to simply frame them. But what's the definition of framing? Um, Dr. David Dorenbaum, who thinks he's my psychiatrist, and I think I'm his artist, uh, dropped this uh, Breuer chair frame off at my studio one day. So I, well, redirected its identity or repaired it or framed it. And then I sold it back to him. He's paid me far more money than I'll ever pay him. And this piece says it turns out has been quite popular uh, in that I've made uh, a number of versions of it and sold them. Um, and I believe this piece was exhibited uh, at the center um, in the On the Edge of Your Seat exhibition. I'm not sure how it was received. Never underestimate the dexterity of ignorance. And I mean that only in the nicest way. Often artists are their own worst enemies. Uh, we tend to self-restrict ourselves to a singular craft quite often, and there's really no reason for that. Um, as many of you know, I, I started out as a serious woodworker and quickly realized that you can apply the approach to almost anything. I found these uh, two old violin cases, which are uh, loaded emblems uh, as it is, and created this around the idea that perhaps the blade is uh, mightier than the sword. Um, that tools can be both beautiful and in the service of evil. The hand planes are uh, presented like a pair of dueling pistols um, or concealed weapons. And a new uh, client, uh, he was just 40, uh, came into my studio and had to have these two pieces, had to have them, I'll buy them right now. Uh, it shocked me, but he said, uh, how will I ever display them? And he has quite a significant collection of flat art. Uh, and he had only just started to think about sculpture. Um, so I devised this, um, he said, figure it out, I'll be back. So I built this table 
uh, in the flavor of the violin woodworking, the cases, kind of the, the same finish. Um, and I felt that he forced me to make a better piece um, and solve the, the framing of the, of the two pieces, pointing out to me that, they, that the piece was not yet finished. Uh, even Ernie's uh, Restored Night um, is a compilation of pre-existing objects, uh, slightly redirected or, or re-paired up. Um, the oak frame is from the 1700s. The case uh, is something that I found. Um, the velvet is out of my neighbor, the upholsterer's dumpster. And even the image is not original and picture lights are nothing new. Uh, there are some subliminal signifiers though. It intrigues me that he uh, hung it in his basement though. Uh, he paid a lot of money for this uh, and, and won't bring it upstairs. Uh, my ego confronted him with that. And he said, oh, blah, 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 blah. But he did say, only a very few people, Gord, that come into my home would appreciate this piece. So I keep it in the basement. Hmm. When I meet someone, I try to figure out what their neurosis is and see if I can find a way to align it with my own. And I think that's the curious confluence that um, has to occur for an object to sell. It's just very interesting, the patterning that began to occur as I tried my hardest to pull this blanket um, over the Judy. Of course, it's a dressmaker's Judy. Um, this was the, the, the lines that had to occur to, be, to make a tight fit. Not a design. Um, the people that bought this um, put it in their bedroom. Uh, near this, uh, this artwork by another artist uh, that contained an early uh, trade axe. And I thought that was uh, kind of weird. But again, uh, should the artist be able to control not only who they sell it to, but where it should be placed in a home and next to what. I mean, this control thing uh, is part of being an artist, I imagine. Tables uh, should be made out of wood, I guess. So I literally did that. Um, first in 1998, made a table out of wood. Uh, you saw that Ernie and Louise owned several of these, uh, which is not unusual for people. Uh, I've sold about 50 of these uh, tables over the years, and I, I still find it very difficult to get them right. Um, and I guess clients maybe feel, often feel the same. Made this while holidaying by the lake. I like the efficiency of these because uh, I can scavenge anywhere and with very few tools uh, feed myself. I find it quite entertaining uh, the variety of contexts that these end up in. Uh, historical, uh, decorative arts, uh, homes, uh, modern homes, art collections, 
design, people with very sophisticated interiors and uh, barbarians too. People only like what they already recognize, what is familiar. Uh, so when they say, when people say, I want change or I want the new, deep within that request, I think also exists the desire for the extremely familiar. And that is the artist's role, to suggest the most unfamiliar thing about the familiar or the most familiar thing about the unfamiliar. And I think we actually see through objects towards an ideal. The demi loon. There's 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 a few iconic forms that that sustain that persist uh, throughout time, and the demi loon um, table is one of them. So I can keep coming back to this form, and it seems to me that no matter what damn shape they 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 are made out of a material or shape they take, people see the demi loon, the iconic demi loon, through them. Recently, I'm thrilled to say um, that the center purchased this one, um, which, as uh, Nava has said, uh, links the history of the future uh, with the past, um, uh, links the, the history of the center with the future of the center. And um, so I'm really happy that it's in their collection. It took them a little while to, uh, to get around to this, um, but uh, I noticed as soon as I sent this image, it sort of lit a fire under them. I uh, once entered one of these tables made of wood uh, to a craft to show and it was refused. And um, I sort of, called them on it and I sort of knew why it might be refused. I mean, they are just junk. And they said, well, no, it wasn't that. It was <clears throat> that there was some glue showing. And I said, oh, I see. So uh, woodworking is about wood and never about glue, ever. So then I started making things out of just glue. Uh, the center was the vehicle that sold uh, two of these uh, bowls uh, for me. I think uh, Albert uh, owns one, I think. Is he still awake? Yeah, just oh, keep good. Thumbs up. Um, thank you, Albert. And um, as he does own uh, many of my artworks, I realized. It's also made out of uh, uh, epoxy resin. She's not naked. That's my daughter, so don't even go there. But I wanted you to understand the, the way light works with this is a fiberglass resin. Um, so um, displaying these is a little tricky. But one of these hangs, this, this exact piece hangs over one of my tables made of wood in a home. again, the fiberglass uh, resin. So they're very delicate and very thin and very lightweight, but the way light plays with them is actually the trick. The gentleman that owns this owns about 30 of my works, big and small, and even rents a storage unit for, for many of them, which he blames me for uh, monthly. I hear all about that. Uh, at any given time, I have three or four clients I'm engaged with, so I just keep stepping back until I have a perspective on what, uh, what could go where next. This was a panel. They wanted something that would sort of, sort of divide the dining room. The dining room table is in your, in your lower left uh, from the entrance hallway. And this slides back and forth across. It's not a door. 
It's not a wall. Uh, it's in, in my studio, uh, making it. Um, that's after we painted. Uh, and there's one of my little uh, tables made of wood in their hallway. I don't know why her, she puts her damn purse on it. But um, people want to make artists happy if we let them. Um, and it does become intimate, often very intimate. Um, it has to, relationship with clients. People all, all love coming to my studio and poking around projects as they're progressing. Um, Sabina brought her uh, twin boys by. Don't they look like angels? Well, they're not. There's the devils right there. Um, but uh, she left though, just said, I've got to go to a meeting and sort of left the boys. So I put them to work. Uh, this is her dining room table where we're trying to get finished. So I have no problem with enslaving children. I've done many, many projects for this home, large and small, some more successful than, than others, as is often the case. But with many of my clients, I end up at their dinner tables uh, and their impressions and discoveries about the objects slip out uh, subtly between the conversations and between the topics of the evening. Um, and that's really, for me, when the payment starts to happen. They can give me money, but then finding out about the work, about the work and them, and about the work in their lives is actually really, really fascinating and very, very valuable to me. I've witnessed many uh, divorces in my career. Uh, like easily uh, 10 divorces and, and often seemingly right after I deliver a new work. Uh, not that I caused it, uh, maybe necessarily, or I think, but the objects seem intimately caught up in the backdraft of, of somehow, um, or they're the signifiers of surrounding events or emotions, or li they're like lightning rods. Um, and in fact, uh, Sabina got divorced uh, at about the same time that I delivered uh, this. Uh, they were completely renovating their home uh, and had torn out a beautiful front entranceway, threw it in the dumpster. I climbed into the dumpster and um, created this. And I thought I was a genius. The uh, the top is the cut glass transom lead light uh, that was over the front doors and it, the light comes down through this and reflects on the floor. It was actually quite, quite a lovely uh, piece. But when I visited again, um, a few months later, I found that both my table uh, and the husband were outside. Uh, that's, that's what my table now looks like. I, I, can't, I don't know what the husband looks like. Um, I take it all in stride. Um, it was quite a shock to me. She said, get it out of here. I don't want it in the house. Out my table went. Um, I, I'm still around. I don't know where the husband is. Um, this, caused, this caused a divorce. Uh, and I mean it, as soon as it was delivered, they separated. Uh, recently, many, many, many years later, the owner uh, sold it to uh, John Brown uh, at the uh, Chipstone Museum in Milwaukee. Uh, I didn't have the heart to warn him um, that it might uh, 
anyways. But right after that sale, uh, the couple started speaking again. This caused one. They, it was a gift um, to his wife, her ring size, her bangle size, and a necklace that there'd be no way to get it on. Just called 10 circles. <clears throat> Everything's milled to within a thousandth of an inch. Um, my stuff has gotten caught in alimony disputes quite often. The wife's name is on the receipt. But the husband actually feels he owns it or he knows she wants it. So he holds it in hostage in exchange for something else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they both want me to side with them individually. It can be wonderfully uh, messy. So. And in fact, Ernie's first marriage was the first thing he bought from me. Um, this entered the house and Ernie's car became his office. I like woodworking because it's so dangerous. But placing artwork into someone's world comes with fascinating risks too. Um, divorced or otherwise, I'm still in touch with most of the people I've done uh, work for. Um, just wanna go back here before I get into that. And, and um, they often will send me images of, of pieces or a note, uh, 20, even 30 years later, I'll get a message about something. Um, Albert sent me an image of something that I had made just because of the way the light fell on it that evening. Bang, up an email comes out of the blue. So uh, I find that very special. Um, this is an entranceway to an art school, much like uh, the art school, um, like, I don't know, Haystack or uh, Anderson Ranch or somewhere like that. Uh, Halliburton School of the Arts. Um, and they also have a, uh, a sculpture forest this was done, well, I don't know, about 10 years ago, but they have a sculpture forest that I'm presently about to start work on a piece for their sculpture forest. It's a boardroom entranceway. And this is uh, the beginning of a, a 35 foot long, well, a table and two chairs uh, for a sculpture park just out, out, out of, outside the city where I live, made of scrap brass. This just kept going. I had to take out those doors you see at the end there and go right through and into the next room. And then it was all dismantled and assembled on site. These projects are interesting, but I don't have the same access to feedback. So while I do these architectural installations and public art, in many ways, there's no there there. It's just a detail from that table. And that's how the piece looks. And now because I planted wild roses that come and grow in the summer all up through all the uh, gaps and cracks in the piece. And now this year, the table is almost completely 
obliterated, which is perfect. It just looks like a giant rose bush in the summertime. Uh, this is me working on a, a, a broken chair. Uh, I started out just to repair, to repair the chair, just to repair a broken leg, uh, but uh, it quickly uh, escalated into some other animal. So uh, just to close, uh, I came to the conclusion early on that, that I had two responsibilities as an artist. One, to locate my, my voice, and maintain it. And um, the other is uh, to locate a place for that voice to be heard and maintain that. And, and both are moving targets. And I guess that's what keeps me engaged. And uh, that's my presentation. And I thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, Gord. Um... I, I first of all, I want to um, encourage everyone here to um, write their comments or questions for Gord in the, in the chat. Um, and then Katie and I will make sure that they get to Gord and that he has a chance to answer or comment on them. Um, I, I have a lot of questions, but I want to make sure that, that you all have a chance to uh, type in. Um, I guess first of all, Gord, being being um, um, you know engaged in a with a public collection, my first question to you is how um, how does locating your work in a public collection change being that the relationship between the collector and the work is necessarily different than if it's in a a private um, space where the activity of daily life is happening around it. Yeah, there's there's a big difference. So I I can't um, public collections. You know, there, there's a lot of things I've I've come to realize aren't what we thought they were. Um, while I love to have my work in public collections, and, and there, there are some, they're not always on, on view, so they're not, all, they're not really there. If they're not on view, they're not, they're not there anywhere. So I, I don't really quite understand, you know, artists like to have a list of, and you read mine, or maybe you didn't, it was in my CV, and I read it, the number of collections I'm in, public collections, but I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't really get it. Um, it's nice for the ego of the artist, but no one else really cares. Well, and, um, I, clearly I have to disagree with that. <laughs> but if it's in a public collection and it's on display, that means that, that everybody has a chance to access it. So what I need to do is sleep in the museums Mm -hmm. um, and and be a, uh, a a security guard uh, because if you've ever no if you notice the security guards always will drum up a conversation with you and I thought to myself that's my that's the only way that's what I want to do is just sort of mill about and listen and participate in conversations and if asked I'm just the security guard I could I could rent one of those uniforms. Um, but um... that is what I that so early on when when we are watching you um, break and enter the home of your collector and and um, deliver a critique of of their methods of display or their um, housekeeping habits, um, I, I I I was reminded of this oncoming theme like you know what happens at the museum when they turn off the lights and the guards go home and what what is the secret life of objects that we can fantasize about? Um, maybe maybe that's something that maybe that's a performance we arrange with you at some point. Um, yes, it was. Uh, I I was uh, I felt very strange in their home. Um, when they weren't there. And 
um, I realized not what I anticipated would happen uh, in that now I realized for you, I was there. Um, so it didn't quite work uh, in a funny way. It's almost like no one had to be there. Um, uh, I was not comfortable uh, at all. Uh, so it was quite an unexpected treat in a way for me. And um, I have to say that in, in, an, in a lot of ways, each of the objects had, had, were dead. Uh, that was disappointing to me. I didn't anticipate that. They were just sitting there. Uh, uh, they meant it, it was like dead wood. Uh, yet when I'm there, when they're there, those pieces come alive and the home is vibrating and there's movement and there's an energy in the house. And when Ernie and Louise weren't there, I had very little interest. Um, but I knew it might be interesting for you to sort of snoop around a stranger's house. I, I thought it still might be interesting. Um, are Ernie and Louise uh, aware at this point? Yes. That uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they were they're they're cool. I mean, at any given time, uh, I thought about that. Um, I have, or I know where the keys are to. I always have about three clients that I'm doing a lot of work for, and I'm I'm free to enter their house whenever I feel like it. I I don't knock and I don't ring ring the doorbell, um, and I know where the keys are. And I thought that's that's funny, but. Um, uh, what, what, you know, it's, how, why do they buy so much art? I think that trust is a big part of what's going on. Um, and that they, the guard, their art guard is completely down. And anything I propose, um, they believe I'm doing it in their best interest. Like that large white cabinet, they did not want that. They, did, they had no interest in anything. And I proposed that as just an idea. Uh, that would that would be a hard sell under under normal circumstances, but they you know believed that what I was saying was true, and and bought it, bought into the idea. I sell something quite often and then make it. Mm. It it's um it occurred to me when you were when you were sort of revealing. Um, when you were tracing your steps to those spaces, but this was being the first time I assume that it was on, on your own, alone in their space, um, that you were describing different things that had happened while you were there visiting them. And, and it occurred to me that maybe the stories here is, aren't about the objects themselves, but about the relationships. Yeah, um, yeah the, the ob ob as I say, objects don't ride alone. Mm -hmm. An object is a boring, stupid looking thing unless it has conditions that connect it. Um, you know, I could say I, that might, that probably applies to the table you just purchased. There's all sorts of stuff swirling around between you and Albert and me and all of the people at the center for that table to land where it has. Uh, otherwise that's just a dumb looking table. Um. I, I um, Neshe, who is um, an intern at the center, asks actually a really great kind of question um, that might be the next step forward, where you get to um, you get to view the objects in context, in a living context, but you're still the observer, and that is to be the fly on the wall. Yeah. Um, well, how would you do that with a drone? <laughs> we have uh, to figure that out. <laughs> I was thinking that probably even better for your audience tonight, what I should have done is just asked Ernie and Louise to give a tour of their collection. <laughs> uh, just, I don't know. How boringly untransgressive of you. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, what, what I, Louise was a little bit horrified. Um, when she found out what I had done, uh, but but only because 
you didn't maybe notice, but there's certain pieces completely missing from their decor. Because what she does is she stages homes to sell. So she'll take pieces, uh, even sometimes my pieces, out and take them to the home where they're trying to sell. So she was absolutely horrified that I had videoed her home in an incomplete state. She takes great pride in her interiors. Ernie had no problem at all. He couldn't care who care less who breaks into his house. Even even the man cave areas downstairs. <laughs> yeah. What what a mess. <laughs> wow. I I love uh, having that piece in the in the basement. And you know it's very very strange, but before. Um, before I did this, uh, I was talking to Louise some time ago and she had decided that it was about time they moved that piece up into their living room to the, where that piece, that, that fake uh, Picasso uh, print, I don't, know how, well, I don't know why that's there, uh, is, is sitting. And I thought, uh, uh, wow, isn't that funny that, why now? Where did, where did that come from? They haven't, they didn't hear me complaining or see the, but I, I realized, no, I, I'm going to try and convince them to leave it in the basement. Uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's to be discovered. It's an afterthought. You, you maybe see it when you visit their home, but probably you won't see it. And I like that piece like that. And the doors are even shut. And unless you asked, to open those doors and turn those lights on, you don't get access. So I'll, I'll devise something interesting for them to, uh, to commission for upstairs. I'll get a sale out of it somehow or another. So, so that reminds me, so there's a question from Jordan Gemon here. Um, how do you suggest going about building these kinds of intimate relationships with the intimate and I assume also lasting relationships with um, art collectors? Yeah, well, watch out for art collectors. <clears throat> That's a different breed. Um, I wondered why you were so careful to use the word client. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's many different reasons people assemble things. So first of all, as an artist, you've got to decide what you're after and then keep your eye on the target. You know, If you want your work only in big museum collections, make sure that's what you get. If you want your work in, uh, say, the collections that are put together to uh, uh, acquire wealth, or to build equity, make sure that's what you end up doing. Because I'm a fan of that too. I mean, speculating on, on the art market is, is I think brilliant. It's, it's as fascinating as anything. Um, so you sort of have to decide who interests you, you know, what kind of people can you get the biggest bang for the buck back from? Um, who, who, what type of people interest you? Um, and chances are, Jordan, uh, you already know all those people because that's the kind of people your, as I said earlier, your neur neurosis aligns with other people's neurosis. And that's who kind of you start to hang with. Uh, they just usually have to have a little bit more money than you do, but not a lot more. Um, so chances are, Jordan, you're very close to them already. You just maybe um, haven't noticed them, but perhaps they've noticed you. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to return to the, um, the question about, that you asked about um, which interventions are mine and which are theirs. And, um, and being that your work kind of, you know, there is, the, there is the world of furniture, but then there's also the world of sculpture and interpretation of furniture. And um, so is, you know, when you open a drawer of something that you've made, 
um, and they're, they're like envelopes or bills or like pens from the bank stuffed in there. What is the visceral reaction to seeing that, that kind of like clash of banality with, with something that you've authored and thought and put together? Well, I guess I said that out loud by purpose uh, in that why do people put their shit on my art? But um, it's not, it wasn't really a comment. It was an observation that uh, look what I have done. Look where I have put my work by purpose. This is where I thrive. I want you to trip over my stuff and I want your cigarette ashes on the surface. I want the stuff in your life. Um, and I think, you know, in, in, any conceptual ideas we have about sculpture <clears throat> occurs in the home as children from your furniture. That's where sculpture comes from. It's the body other, right? It's, it's the forms that are not me, but like me, you know, my other, almost, um, mother. So there's some strange relationships going on with furniture. It took me many years to understand that, that these, and you learn everything that's important, but between the ages of <clears throat> three and seven, uh, and, 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 and uh, they're the lasting lessons. Um, furniture is sculpture. It just looks a hell of a lot like furniture. So it's very difficult to see. Uh, Uber, presence makes it invisible. But um, I, I do complain to my clients that the place is a mess sometimes. And what happened to that? Like, where did that ding come from on the table? Like, what the hell's going on here? And then on the other hand, I go, whoa, yeah, but you know, you want me to sign that ding? It's like, uh, so I, I flip flop back and forth because I had training as an artist and with that comes some crazy baggage of uh, ego that, um, you know, the object in a white sterile room. I mean, oh my God, where did that come from? Like what a nuisance that is, that concept. It's, it's not real, right? So, so um, and I, uh, I, I often visit my, uh, my, my clients and, uh, we just hang out. Are they my friends? I think they have to be. So I don't, there'd be no way to separate those two things. People that intimately get what you're trying to do as an emotional human being would have to eventually be your friend. There's, there's no escaping it. Hmm. That, so that, um, that uh, brings us to Scott Braun's question, which is really more of um, a reminder of an event that you did uh, with Furniture Society. Um, and you had a, an on-site dialogue with your therapist who then wrote a beautiful essay um, or actually multiple essays, I think in your last book. If, um, and so I, I guess first he wanted to, um, he wanted to know if that's something, if, if there's any recording of that or you could share it with his students in some way. Um, but there is, I would mention that book uh, as, as a possibility, of course. Um, now on my uh, Instagram site, um, I think there's a, well, there's a link to one of the books, uh, recent books, recent book, where yes, uh, Dr. Dornbaum wrote an essay and also the first book is available on Amazon and uh, he wrote an essay in that. Who, who asked the question? Scott Braun. Scott? Mm-hmm. Uh, Where are you? There he is. I'm here. <laughs> they're, they're, I guess they're not online anyway, anywhere, um, but they're certainly in the books, I guess. Um, I'll find them. Why, why would they be online? I don't think they are. No. 
But it, it reminds me, Gord, I did want to ask you about, you know, your recent, I believe you told me this was with your daughter's assistance, your recent um, um, entry onto social media and Instagram, and then the documentation that's, that's come with that of your works, sort of piece by piece. Um, are you are you encountering these objects again in a different way with this process, or um, is it Instagram a site? Sorry, with the Instagram site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that began. Um, well, first of all, Jasmine. My daughter, the youngest daughter, said, uh, Daddy, uh, nobody under 40 has ever heard of you. Uh, get with the world. Get with the world. Uh, so uh, she said, this is what I'll do. We'll do an Instagram uh, site and I'll do the postings. So, and she was traveling all over the world and I would still, she would still do the postings. And I said, oh, God, do I have to talk, make, talk to all these people? And she says, yes, you're surprised. No, I'm not going to. Um, but it, it, I thought it was a great idea. At the time, the second book uh, didn't look like it was going to uh, be printed. Um, and I thought, well, so, you know, how can this Instagram site be, well, like an online book where I get to choose uh, what I might say for each image? Yes, sometimes many years later. Um, I look at a piece and go, yay or nay. Uh, and uh, I, I, have, I have a little something to say about each image. If anyone takes the time to read those notes, um, their thoughts from now, yes, about older work. Uh, and I will continue with that, uh, posting uh, new pieces. Um, and then, very old pieces, I guess. So, uh, I think that um, you can't uh, underestimate the potency of older work. I mean, some artists say, oh, that old thing. Uh, and I remember doing that when I was young. You just never wanted to see your older work. I mean, no, I, I'm past that by a month. But, but uh, no, I think, uh, boy, if I only knew now what I knew then. Uh, so, you know, young people are very, 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 very wise in, an, in, in a sterile sort of way. And, and so are old people, very, 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 very wise in, in an isolated sort of way. So, interesting. See them. Uh, John Everett is asking which pieces you keep for yourself, if if any. His wife makes him keep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, I don't tend to keep too much uh, work of my own. Uh, um, I, I at any given time, I either have. Um, I sort of have a, a bigger project on the go, like a public sort of thing, um, something for a private residence that, that is also usually, you know, kind of the idea is sold first and, and then I make it, um, and a speculative work. Um, speculative work is not, you know, none of this is sort of for me to keep. I don't think that way anymore. Um, and even the last image that I showed, that crazy braced uh, chair together. Um, so, and, and, and the speculative work I know is beyond my clients that I have right now. Uh, it's beyond, beyond their, their ability to absorb into their homes. It's just, it's, it's, it's not gonna work yet but I know I tend to run into eventually the people that will buy these speculative works. So sometimes they do hang around the house for, for years, but I know eventually that person's going to show up and they usually do. Um, so um, 
And so yeah, how that's do a, you... It's one of the big problems of being an artist. If you're not careful, you, you end up storing your own stuff, which is uh, the recipe for bankruptcy. Um, you know, which you, you have to be very careful to trying to make a living as an artist, not to get trapped in the, I got all my work thing. Um, well, that very um, smoothly leads us into John's next question, which is um, how does the artist bridge that connection between the making and the selling? Or maybe facilitate the connection, I would. Uh, well, uh, if I'm making it, it's good. And there's no reason why somebody wouldn't buy it. There, you see that that's the naive, uh, naive approach to that's what goes on in my head. It, it, you know, it, I'm not wasting, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to make great work. And therefore, people are going to buy it or they're stupid. Well, as I said, sometimes people are stupid for several years, but eventually they get unstupid and buy it. Um, so I, I don't know that there, there's a bridge or a gap. Um, as an artist, as a professional, if you're making work, it's your voice. It's a, uh, art is a tool of communication. If it doesn't communicate, to another human being, then is it still art? Like, I don't, I don't know what that is. If it, again, if it doesn't land somewhere, if, 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 mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if you're a ditch digger, but nobody's paying you to dig ditches, are you a ditch digger? Uh, if you're a teacher, but no institution is paying you to teach, are you a teacher? You, you can't avoid it's almost unavoidable economics. Well, it's impossible not to sell art. So back to the title of this talk, if art doesn't land anywhere, what is it? Yeah, what is it? <laughs> well, now that we've completely um, oh. muted Gord, <laughs> <laughs> on that question. Um, everybody is welcome to unmute yourselves um, and say hi. I know we have a lot of people who um, know each other here and it's good to see all your faces. Um, and um, and oh. I'm just gonna say thank you, Gord. And uh, thank you so much for um, sharing your points of view with us today. It's always, always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, thank you. All, uh, what a great group. I see you all now. Mm -hmm. There's more over there. So have a good evening and thank you for uh, hanging out with us tonight. Um, email me if you want me to talk to you. <laughs>